Well, good morning, Meadowbrook. How are we doing this morning? So good to see all of you here today. Special welcome to those of you who are joining us online. We are so glad that you are with us this morning. So when I was in college, I was part of a campus ministry, and uh, my sophomore year, I was on the leadership team of that campus ministry. And every month, we would have a leadership team meeting on Sunday right before our weekly gathering. So for those of us who are on the team, we'd meet for a couple hours to plan where we're going over the course of the next month, and then we'd go from there right to the weekly gathering. And on this particular evening, or this Sunday afternoon, we were having that leaders meeting um, at an on-campus apartment of one of the other students on the leadership team. And it was one of those campus apartments that like all these like apartments are smushed together. It's like you walk into the lower level and that's where the kitchen and the living room are. And then there's some stairs that take you to the upstairs where bedrooms and the bathroom were like really swanky on-campus apartments. And so we finish our leadership meeting. We're then transitioning to um, our weekly meeting. And before we leave, I'm like, hey, I guess got to run to the bathroom and then we'll go. So I, I go upstairs. Um, I do my business. I flush the toilet. And then as I flush the toilet, something strange happens. Everything starts to go down, but then it just stops. And then everything starts to come back up. And the water's rising, and I see it coming. And it gets maybe like two-thirds of the way full, and then everything just whoo, stops. And I'm like, man, whoo, crisis averted. Now, I don't know anything about engineering when it comes to plumbing, but I had this thought in my mind, maybe, just maybe, one more flush <laughs> and a little bit more water will help everything drain. And so, like, I'm just like, I'm going for it, and I flush it again, and I hold my breath, and I see, like, nothing is going down. Everything is coming back up, and it's getting higher and higher and higher, and it gets to the top of the bowl, and then it like starts to spill over onto the floor. Now, I took my shoes off to be respectful when I came in, so I'm just wearing socks, and water is now all over the floor coming towards me, and it's starting to get on my socks, and so I take my socks off. I throw them in the tub. I roll up my pant legs. I grab a plunger, and I'm just standing there like this, like I'm ready to do battle with this toilet but I'm also like stuck, free, frozen, like what do I do? Because I'm thinking if I plunge, that's just going to make more of a mess because water's already going everywhere. And I'm just standing there and there's a knock on the door. And the woman who like lives in this apartment, she's like, Brian, everything okay? I'm like, yeah, hey, I'm fine. I'm good. Everything's fine. She's like, no, hey, Brian, how about you let me in? I'm like, no, why would I let you in? I'm good. Everything's fine. She goes, Brian, the water, turn off the water. And then I realized, oh yeah, there's this valve at the base of the toilet connected to the wall that turns off the water for the toilet. So I turn it off, and then I'm just standing there again. She's like, Brian, let me in. I'm like, no, 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 really, I've got this. Everything's okay. She's like, Brian, let me in. So I put the plunger down. I grab my socks. I open the door. I hang my head in shame, and I just walk out the bathroom. She rushes in to see what I have done, and then I go down the stairs, and as I'm halfway down the stairs, somebody else is going upstairs to see what happened, and I think to myself, how did they know? Like, how did they know that I was in a moment of panic in the bathroom upstairs? I finish going downstairs, I turn the corner, and what I see is a waterfall coming from the ceiling light fixture onto the table, and all of these people are around like with bowls and cups trying to catch this water. I was the only guy on this leadership team. It was me and a bunch of ladies, and I said, guys, I'm out. I will see you at our weekly meeting, and I just left, and I contemplated not even going to the weekly meeting. When we get to the weekly meeting, I'm trying to avoid everybody who is in that leadership team. We finish our weekly meeting, and then somebody comes up to us and says, hey, it was Bobby Joe who actually plunged the toilet and cleaned up the mess. Now, Bobby Joe was our faculty advisor, so she was on staff with the school, and she was the leader, kind of like the head leader who oversaw everything. And she was the one who cleaned up my mess. She was the RD in the dorm where I was an RA, which meant I was going to have to see her on a weekly basis for the rest of the year. And she would be reminded continually of having to clean up my mess. So I ask you, what would you have done in that situation not so much if you were me. I mean, I'm sure many of you would have had a way better response if you were me in that situation. But what would you have done if you were this woman named Bobby Joe, a faculty advisor, 
Somebody who has no business cleaning up the mess of a sophomore, let alone like really getting dirty in the process. But she just humbly, like without question, without thought, she just went, the woman who lived there, her name was Steph. She's like, Steph, get out of here. I'll take care of this. Clean up the mess so we could all go to the meeting. Like, if you were in that situation, what would you have done? How would you have responded? John 13 kind of marks the start of a new chapter, uh, not just an actual chapter, but a section of Jesus' story in uh, John's gospel. And while Jesus isn't necessarily cleaning up after a clogged toilet, he is doing cleaning in another regard. And in this moment, what he does is he sets an example for his disciples there and for us as to how we are called to live our lives when it comes to doing the dirty work, but also shows us the mindset and the motivation for why we would step in and do something like that. So what you see at the beginning of John 13 is a contrast from where we've been before, from chapters 1 through 12, because up to that point, Jesus' ministry has been largely public. Jesus' ministry has been largely out in the open. Regularly through John's gospel, Jesus is teaching in the temple. He's teaching out on the hillside. He's gathering large crowds to him. He's performing signs and wonders that are amazing people and drawing and attracting more people to him. He's been doing things very publicly, but once we cross into chapter 13, he's now in a private moment with just him and his disciples. And this private moment is around a dinner table. It's around a final meal that Jesus is having with his disciples before he goes to the cross. And through the course of this evening, from John 13 to John 17, he's going to teach them all sorts of things right before his life is over. But during this meal, the first thing that he does is teach them something, not by saying anything, but he teaches them something by embodying something, by demonstrating and setting an example. The meal is going on, the meal is already in progress, and Jesus gets up from the meal and does this, starting in verse 4 of chapter 13. It says, he got up from the meal. He took off his outer clothing and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and he began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with a towel that was wrapped around him. Now, in ancient Jewish culture, foot washing was a common practice. People traveled by foot, right? That was how they got around. They, they walked everywhere that they went. The roads were dirty. The roads were dusty. So naturally, as people traveled, their feet would grow dirty. And so as people entered in to somebody's home, they would naturally, instinctively wash their feet. And foot washing was a mutually beneficial act between a, goat, a, a host and a guest. From the vantage point of the guest, it was an act of respect, minimizing the dirt that you're bringing into somebody's home. And from the vantage point of the host, it was an act of hospitality. It was a way to welcome them, clean yourself up, come on in. Let's make this a comfortable setting for you. And it would also be common for somebody in the host home to do the foot washing of a guest's feet. But it usually would not have been the host. It might have been a child. It might have been a spouse of the host. But it was seen to be a very menial task. And so most often, if there was a servant in the home, it would have been the servant who did the washing of feet. Now, in some ancient Jewish literature, it was said that foot washing should actually be reserved for a Gentile servant. It's such a low task that not even a Jewish servant should do foot washing, but it should be reserved for somebody who is outside the family of God's people. Now, if there was a rabbi present or a teacher present, one of the things that might happen on occasion is that a student or a pupil of the teacher would do the foot washing as a sign of honor and respect for the teacher, which might remind us of chapter 12. In chapter 12, Jesus is at the home of Mary and Martha, uh, Jesus uh, has raised Lazarus, their brother, from the dead, and they're hosting a meal in his honor. And in the middle of that meal, we're told that Mary comes and anoints Jesus with oil, and what she does is she makes sure to anoint his whole body, even his feet. In a moment there, you see a student honoring a teacher through washing and anointing 
his feet. But in this moment, Jesus flips the script on the foot washing. Now, Jesus doesn't have a home, but essentially he is hosting this meal in somebody else's home. There very well could have been servants in this home, but Jesus doesn't expect the servants to do the foot washing. Jesus, the host of this meal, is the one who gets up from the meal, wraps a towel around him, fills up a basin of water, and goes one by one through all of his disciples and washes their feet, embodying what he says in other places, in other gospels. I have come not to be served, but I have come to serve, to sacrificially serve. And this moment ends up being very disruptive for the disciples. So we move into to verse 6. There's an exchange between Peter and Jesus, and it shows not just how Peter, but all of the disciples are perceiving this moment. We read in verse 6, He, being Jesus, came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Like Peter has no category for this. He has no category for what Jesus is doing. It's confusing. It's disrupting. In his mind, Jesus is the leader. He's the one in charge. He's the one who is held up above all of them. Somebody else should be washing his feet. It's not that he should be going around washing theirs. And this interaction between Peter and Jesus kind of serves as a representation for all the disciples, because on occasion, Peter is positioned as the spokesperson for the disciples. We might think of John chapter 6. After Jesus feeds this large crowd of people, people start to leave because they want more free food from Jesus. He's not giving them another free lunch. He starts to teach and say things that are really hard, like if you want eternal life, you've got to eat my flesh and drink my blood. And all of these kind of on-the-fence disciples are like, hey, I'm out. And then Jesus turns to the disciples and says, are you guys going to leave too? And Peter stands up, pipes up for all of the disciples and says, hey, where are we going to go? You are the one who has the words of eternal life. Peter serves as the spokesperson at time for all of the disciples. And in this moment, even though Peter is the only one who is recorded to have said anything in this moment, we can assume that his reaction is the same as the reaction of every other disciple. Jesus says to Peter, as he's confused and asks, are you going to wash my feet? Verse 7, Jesus replied, you do not realize now what I'm doing, but later you will understand. Peter is so turned around by what Jesus is doing, so confused to see someone like Jesus doing this task, he actually begins to resist Jesus' service. Verse 8, no, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. I wonder here if anybody at times uh, finds themselves in a place where they don't want people to see them in moments of weakness. Anybody ever find that to be true of you? Yeah, yeah. I wonder if anybody here this morning ever finds himself in a place where they don't want people to see you in a place of vulnerability or, or to see you in a place where you don't have it all together or to see you in a place where your life is a mess and you come on Sunday and you're like, yeah, everything's fine, we're fine, we're just holding it all together, we're fine. I wonder if, he, I wonder if anybody here has, has ever resisted a push back, or not wanted people to come into their home because it's not perfect and immaculate and just right all the time. Anybody? Uh, Becky and I had some friends reach out to us from um, Atlanta who wanted to come visit. There was a chance they were going to come visit in September. We have this nasty old ratty couch. Like, it is disgusting. We got it when we first moved here. Our kids have, like, grown up on this couch have spilled everything on this couch. Dogs have done other things on this couch. Like it's getting to the point where like you can start to see through the top of the fabric on this couch. And these friends say, hey, we might come visit in September. And Becky and I's first response is, we need to go buy a new couch. Like tomorrow, because they might come and visit. 
we would be aghast if these good friends of ours from Atlanta would see and sit on this couch as though they're coming to our home to inspect our home, right? Like that's why they're coming for a visit. We, we, we live with this perception at times, like we always have to be showing people our best continually and constantly. And when people get too close and they see the unkempt parts of our world, it's like, hey, 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 hey. you can get close, but not that close. And this isn't the first time we've seen this posture from Peter. Like when Jesus calls him initially in Luke chapter 5, G- Peter's first response to Jesus is, away from me, I am a sinful man. Like there's got to be distance between you and me because my life is in shambles half the time and you are holy, I am a sinful man, away from me. Like, Peter is trying to create distance right from the beginning between him and Jesus. And here, Jesus is getting a little too close to comfort, for comfort. Now, what we see in this moment from, like, Peter, how Peter is perceiving this moment, is that what he sees in this moment is just this moment. Meaning, Jesus is too close for comfort. He sees Jesus from his vantage point inappropriately lowering himself humbling himself to serve in a way that's reserved for a servant, not the one who claims to be the Messiah of God's people. But this moment between Jesus, Peter, and the rest of the disciples isn't really about this moment. This moment really isn't about dirty feet that need to be clean. Like so many other things with Jesus, this moment is a pointer to a bigger story about who Jesus is, why he is on earth, and what he has come to do. In the same way, an offer of a drink of water from a well from Jesus isn't really about quenching your physical thirst. In the same way, that a miraculous meal of five loaves of bread and two fish that feeds 5,000 people isn't really about satisfying the hunger pains that live deep within. Both of those moments are pointers to who Jesus is, the living water, the bread of life. He is the one your heart longs for. He satisfies the deep desires of your heart, the the deep thirsts and the deep hungers. And he says, I've come to satisfy all of those things. In the same way that those moments are pointers to a bigger story about who Jesus is, this moment with getting low and washing the disciples' feet is also a pointer to a bigger moment about who Jesus is, a bigger story of what he has come to do. Because what this begins to do for the reader, not so much for the disciples, they still don't get it, and Jesus names that, but for us, the reader, it's a pointer to what Jesus is going to do within about 24 hours. He's going to take his final march to Golgotha with a cross strapped on his back to be nailed and strapped and hung on this thing for the world to see, to provide the ultimate cleansing that we all need. The the cleansing deep in our spirit, deep in our soul of the stain from the stain of our sin. And he comes to lower himself, to humble himself, as it says in Philippians 2, even to the point of death, to become obedient to his Father until the very end, even at the cost of his life, his death on the cross for the sake of providing salvation and redemption and satisfying the penalty of sin for all of humanity at all times. That's why Jesus' response to Peter in this moment is this. Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Verse 9, then, Lord, Simon Peter replied, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. While Peter is hesitant, while somewhat resistant, he's also all in. Like he is fully in. He doesn't fully understand what's going on, but he's all in because he knows that there is no one like this guy that he has ever met before. And he wants to be where this guy is, even when it makes him uncomfortable and unsure. Jesus goes on to say, verse 10, Jesus answered, those who have had a bath only need to wash their feet. Their whole body is clean, and you are clean. See, one reason 
that we should let Jesus close. It's because he knows it all. He knows it all. He's seen it all. Not just in our own lives, but in everyone's life. I mean, he, he knows everything. And in just a minute, we're going to see all of what he does know. But he knows it all. And the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ is that he can handle it all. And that he has, on the cross, handled it all. No matter the sin, no matter the shame, no matter the, the whatever that you're carrying, Jesus can deal with it. He can take it on. He can eradicate it. He can make you new. He can make you whole. He has dealt with it all. And he also knows that going forward, we're not always going to get it right. Like, he knows that with Peter in this moment. It will become clear as this dinner goes on, another exchange is between Peter and Jesus, that Jesus knows Peter isn't always going to get it right. Before the evening and the next day is over, Peter will deny Jesus three times. And what he's saying is even when you make a mistake, I- I've cleansed you, you are clean. Like somehow in Jesus' magnificence and glory, he's appropriating the work on the cross that he is going to do, that he hasn't already done retroactively to Peter and the disciples, you are clean because of what I'm going to do, because you believe in me. And he knows that moving forward, even after that, Peter isn't always going to get it right. And what Peter needs is not a full bath, not a full re-cleansing, but refinement. And that's why he goes on to say, you know, you don't need a full bath. You just need your feet. See, what Jesus is looking for isn't perfection from people. He knows we're not always going to get it right. What he's looking for is continual repentance and dependence on him. A continual coming back to him time and time again because we know that he is the one and the only one who can clean up the mess that we've made. And this moment does two things. It points to the meaning of the mean, or points to the means by which Jesus is going to cleanse us, but it also sets an example for us. Because after he washes all the disciples' feet, we read this in verse 12. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I've done for you, he asked them? You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am now. That I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly, I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that I know these things, now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. So Jesus is saying, I'm cleansing you. I'm making you whole. I'm making you clean. I'm also setting an example for you. And there's three specific things that Jesus sets as an example for us who are his followers to go and continue to do in the way that we live. The first one is to get low. In this moment, Jesus gets low. Like, not only literally low, he gets very low down to the feet, but figuratively he gets low, meaning Jesus, throughout all his ministry, has been emphasizing that he leaves his high position at the right hand of God. Again, that's what Philippians 2 is all about. He who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be taken of his own advantage, but he lowered himself. He humbled himself. He became obedient even to death on a cross. Jesus gets low. All too often, we think way more highly of ourselves than we should. I mean, just this week... um, for kids who, like, work in the children's ministry downstairs, um, Jackie has had this little form that he wants student helpers, teen helpers, to fill out. My kids are part of that. So she's like, hey, Brian, can you fill out these forms for your kids this week so that we can make sure we've got all our stuff buttoned up for them to serve downstairs? I'm like, sure, happy to, right away. Somewhere on the form, there's these reference, like, spots, like, fill out references. And, you know, when we, like, do background checks on people, when we're getting to know people, we want to check references so that we're putting, you know, individual helpers in the rooms with our kids who we've done our due diligence on. We know they're safe. They're going to be good people. And it says on there, for teen helpers, you need two references who's not somebody on staff and not a parent. So I look at that, and I'm like, I'm just going to bang this out real quick. I put Jackie as a reference who's on staff. And I put Brian Marvel, uh, that's me, 
who is their parent and also on staff. I hit submit. This was like on Tuesday or whatever. Like Thursday, I'm in the office and she goes, hey, you filled out that form wrong. I was like, what? What do you mean? She's like, your references. I was like, come on. You're not actually going to check references on my kids, are you? And we had like this five-minute conversation. Megan got in on this conversation. They're like, Brian, you are not following the rules. And basically, I was pushing back like, seriously, are we really going to do this? Are we going to waste our time? My kids are already helping down there. Are we going to waste our time calling references on my kids? You know my kids. And I'm like going on and on. And basically, what I was saying without actually saying it was, do you know who I am? Do you, do you, have you forgotten who I am? And through the course of the conversation, like I had to step back and got, get to the end. I was like, okay, ladies, I will do whatever you tell me to do. Like I will refill out this form. I will make sure my kids fill out this form. I'll get you all the references you want. Even in that little moment, we made light of it. We joked about it. But even in that mo moment, I think too highly of myself all the time think too highly of myself. Somehow the rules don't apply to me, and Jesus is setting an example, even for him, who is the Lord of the universe, to get low. The other thing that he's setting as an example is get close. Get low and get close. See, we are created for community. Here's why you should go engage with neighborhood communities, because you were created for community. You were created to be in relationship with people. But sometimes community can be intimidating because if I get too close to people, they're going to see the mess that I'm trying to cover up in my life. And I don't want people to see what's really going on. So I'm going to stay at a distance and not get involved. Jesus says, no, 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 get close. It's okay for people to see what's going on. Because when you come into community and you serve one another, you have the ability to borrow strength from one another, to borrow life from one another, to borrow support from one another. And what Jesus also models in this moment is not only get, messy, get low, get close, but also get messy. Like it's going to be. Life in community is messy. We are called to carry one another's burdens. We're called to clean up other people's messes. We're called to support people when they fail and they don't get it right. And yes, by associating with people when they're at their lowest moment and other people in life see them at their lowest moment and see you standing with them, you are going to be associated with them. But that's okay, because that's what Jesus does for us. Truthfully, we all abandon Jesus when we're at our lowest, when he's at his lowest, when he's on a cross. Just a few people were at the foot, on the, cross, foot of the cross. Everybody else is like, I'm out. I don't want to be associated with that guy. But he comes close to take on our mess, to associate with us, to get low, so that he can provide redemption for everybody. And we are called to live in that same way. But it raises the question, like, how in the world do we do that? Like, where do we get the power from to do that? Because that's a tall task, to get low, to get close, and to get messy, even when I'm not really truly obligated. What we see at the beginning of John 13 is what Jesus knows. Right? Jesus knows it all. He knows it all about us, but there's a lot of things that Jesus knows about himself in this moment that enables him and empowers him to live the way that he does. This is how this passage begins. This is verse 1. It was just before the Passover festival, and Jesus knew. Jesus knew that, his hour, that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go back to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The evening meal was in progress, and the devil had already prompted Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power, that he had come from God and was returning to God. And then the very next verse is, So he got up from the meal and began to wash the disciples' feet. Two times we read in the first three verses that Jesus knew. And there's three specific things that John highlights that Jesus knows in this moment. The first is Jesus knows his authority. He knows the authority that he has. It says, verse 3, Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power. 
John has established this at the very beginning of his gospel. Chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. In him was life. Jesus is the source of all life. He is the one who is instrumental in the creation and sustainment of all all things. Jesus has all the power. He has all the authority, and he knows it. He knows that he has it. But in this moment, he's putting that aside. Throughout his entire ministry, he's putting that aside. He's not clinging to his power and authority. He's constantly putting it aside and constantly giving it away. And in this moment, he knows the power that he has, but he doesn't cling to it or claim to it. He puts it aside. The other thing that he knows is his destiny. He knows his authority. He also knows his destiny. It says he has come from God. And he knew that the hour had come for him to return to God. He knew that his ultimate destiny wasn't to live on this world forever, but to empower his disciples to go out into the world with his authority to bear witness to what he has done and who he is. Which means Jesus also knows his identity. He knows his authority. He knows his destiny, and he knows his identity. When we think of identity, we often think of identity as wrapped up in what we do. Like, I do this. These are the activities of my life that I spend the majority of my time performing. This is who I am. It's wrapped up in what I do, which means for most of us, we think of identity as something that we achieve. I achieve my identity through what I do, through the accomplishments that I acquire. But what Jesus shows us here is that identity is not something that we achieve. It's something that we receive because identity isn't really about what you do. It's about where you belong and to whom you belong. Jesus is known to be the Son of God. He will always be the Son of God. Where he is going is back to the Father where he belongs. Your identity isn't wrapped up in what you do. It's wrapped up in where and with whom you belong. And Jesus is demonstrating that he knows that. And because he knows that, it enables him and empowers him to wash the disciples' feet, to take on a menial task that is reserved for a servant. And there's two issues that we face as followers of Jesus when we are unwilling to sacrificially serve in the same way that Jesus does. One is we maybe don't know who we are. And when we don't know who we are, we spend a lot of time focused on ourself, trying to figure out who we are. And especially when we think our identity is something that is achieved, we're going out into the world trying to achieve all sorts of things, trying to impress all sorts of people, trying to accomplish all these things. So people will look at us and be like, oh, look what he did. Look what she did. That's who they are. This is my identity. All of these trophies, awards, letters after my names, accomplishments, all these things. When we don't know who we are, we spend a lot of time focused on ourselves. But also, we may come to points where we realize, ah, who I am, all of who I am is actually found in who Jesus is. But there are also times we forget that. And when we forget who we are, we end up floundering and squandering our life. Believe it or not, um, the Lion King captures this perfectly. Because we, we probably all know the story of Lion King. Little Simba is born to Mufasa. He's going to be the next king of the kingdom. Um, But there comes this moment where Simba's evil uncle Scar kills his dad Mufasa and and blames it on Simba. And Simba then runs for his life because he's afraid that everybody at Pride Rock will think he was the one who killed his dad when it was his evil uncle Scar. He goes out into the bush and he finds who? His little buddies Pumbaa and Timon, the meerkat and the warthog. And he learns from Pumbaa and Timon that they have this philosophy of life called hakuna matata. No worries, live a carefree life, essentially have no responsibility in life. Just live it up, yuck it up, have a good time, lounge in the jungle, and have fun. Years goes by, years passes, and Nala, Simba's childhood friend, is out one day trying to find some measure of survival and comes across Simba and learns that she thought Simba was dead but finds out that he is alive. And she says, you have to come back to Pride Rock. You have to help us. And he's like, no, 
I'm not going to. That's my old life. I've learned this new philosophy, hakuna matata, live carefree, have no worries for the rest of your days. It's wonderful. You should actually join me in this way of life. And she says, Simba, you are the king. And then he pushes back and he resists. No, no, Scar is the king. And she says, no, you are the king. She's speaking identity into him. This is who you are. Your destiny is not to squander your life, but to go help your people. They are in need and they need you to return. And once he embraces his identity, once he remembers his destiny and the authority that comes with that, the trajectory of his life changes. And the same is true for us. When we find that our identity is wrapped up in who Jesus is, even when we forget that and we return to him, we're reminded of the authority that we have. You realize you do have authority, right? Like Jesus is constantly giving his disciples his authority. Luke 9, he sends them out and he says it's, he sends them out in his power and his authority. Like you have the, the same authority that Jesus has because you too are a child of God. You too are a son and daughter of of the king, and you have that authority. Your destiny is not to squander your life, but your destiny is to participate with your heavenly father in stewarding his creation and bearing witness to the final end of all things when Jesus returns to make all things right. That's who you are. That's the responsibility that you have. That's the adventure that we are on to participate with the Lord of Lords and King of Kings, to steward all of what we see in the here and now. Essentially, you could say it this way. What Jesus is modeling is that it's your identity. Knowing your identity empowers you to love sacrificially. Because that's what Jesus is doing here. It says, having loved his own who were in the world, verse 1, he loved them to the end. And what's so striking about this passage is that Jesus washes all of the disciples' feet. And we're told one more thing that he knows in verse 10. He says to Peter, you are clean. And he goes, not all of you, not every one of you. For he knew, this is the last thing that he knew. He knew who was going to betray him. And that's why he said, not every one of you was clean. Jesus washes all of the disciples' feet, even Judas's feet, even the one who has already decided to betray him, to send him to his death. And Jesus says, even him, even him. I will die for even him. When we come to realize the immense sacrifice that Jesus has made on our behalf, on the mess that we find ourselves in, in the redemption that he offers, that has the power to change our life. Because we finally come to know, oh, this is who I am. This is who I'm called to be. This is the life that I'm called to live. And it's not intended to be for me, but it's intended to be for the world, to participate in partnership with God for the redemption of all things. And when you know that, and when you come to take ownership of that, it has the potential to change everything. And what Jesus is doing here is simply a pointer to what he does on the cross. He lays down his life for the sake of the world. And so that's why to respond this morning, we're going to go before the Lord's table. I'm going to invite the worship team to come back up. And we're going to go before the Lord's table to finish our time together. Because in this meal, in this simple meal of the bread and the cup, we have embodied for us the sacrificial love of Jesus, who, who gave himself, who spared no expense, poured himself out, in order to demonstrate for the world just who he is and what he has come to do. So in just a moment, our ushers are going to come forward and they're going to dismiss you row by row. And as they do, we're going to invite you to come forward to these four stations. They're all the same. Um, you can have a gluten-free prepackaged option if you want in the little bowls in front of you. But as you come, we just invite you to take two cups. There's going to be two cups stacked on top of each other, one with the bread, one with the, the juice. Um, and then as you go back to your seat, uh, you can go back to your seat through the side aisle. And then when everybody has all the elements, I'll come up and lead us in taking them together. But our invitation to you as you come up front this morning is to contemplate, like, where have I lost my way? 
What, where have I forgotten who I am? In what ways have I been resistant to sacrificially serving the people in my life, the people in my family, the people in my community? And where is God inviting me to get low, get close, and get messy? Lord, we thank you so much for what Jesus did for us, not only in the foot washing, but also on the cross. We thank you so much for the sacrifice that he has made on our behalf. And Lord, we pray that we would never take it for granted, that we would hold it in high regard, and we would understand the high calling that we have as his followers. We pray this in your name. Amen.